Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this Facebook Live broadcast. I'm Allison Johnson from Windsor Regional Hospital. Nobody likes coming to the hospital, especially during a pandemic, but there are definitely times when you should, and even right now. And in fact, there are times when not coming could be a very risky decision. That's what we're talking about today, and we've got a stacked panel of guests here to answer your questions. Please give a thumbs up, everyone, to Dr. David Ng. He's an emergency physician here at Windsor Regional Hospital and department clinical lead for the Erie St. Clair subregion in Ontario West. Hi, Dr. Ng. Dr. Tamara Siddle is the primary care lead for the Erie St. Clair Regional Cancer Program. Good morning. Good morning. And Dr. Delgit Denoa is our chief of diagnostic imaging at Windsor Regional Hospital. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you. And finally, we have June Year. She's the CEO at the Unemployed Help Center in Windsor, one of the first people to test positive for COVID-19 in this region. And as always, she brings the patient perspective to our conversations. Good morning. Good morning, Allison. And welcome to all of you. This is Coping with COVID. It's a series of live conversations about COVID-19. If you have any questions for our guests today, this is your fabulous opportunity jump online, submit them in the comment section below, and we will try and address them in our conversation. So first I wanna go around the table and get you all to help me set this conversation up. Tell me what you've been seeing in your respective areas over the past year. And Dr. Siddle, I wanna start with you because I understand that there are fewer new cases that uh, are being seen in the cancer program and that's not necessarily a good thing. Talk about what you're seeing there. These are the direct result of fewer investigative tests being done. And what we do know over the last uh, 10 or 11 months is that there are definitely fewer patients getting screened. Uh, and these would be eligible patients uh, for part of our three organized screening programs, which include breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer. Uh, so seeing fewer cases is not necessarily a good sign. And what we want to do is promote the message that screening is safe, screening is effective, screening is available and we need our patients to get screened. Now, what do we know about why we're seeing fewer patients? I mean, I can assume that people might be afraid to come to the hospital, but do we have any evidence of that? Uh, yes, we definitely have evidence of this. Uh, there has been mixed messaging over the last number of months. Uh, there have been pauses in the screening program that have come from uh, higher up. Um, and I think patients are a little bit confused about what is safe for them to do, what is deemed an essential service, uh, and what they should be doing. And since there's so much confusion around COVID itself, we get new information every day. We want patients to focus on what they know to be true, and that is that cancer screening is effective and it is an essential service. So we want all of the eligible patients to participate. Uh, and if they have questions, please bring them forward to your healthcare provider they'll let you know how and when to get screened. Great. And Dr. Denoa, this kind of ties in with uh, what you're seeing in your department and uh, diagnostic imaging um, here at the OLET campus. It's right out in the main lobby there, the waiting area. And it was pretty quiet uh, a while back when services were scaled back. What is the situation like now? Yeah, thanks, Allison, uh, for that question. Now we've, um, our volumes are a little bit higher than they were, uh, say from last March or April. We do have more patients coming, but we still are concerned about a subpopulation of patients who perhaps are not presenting to the hospital or may have some hesitancy um, coming to the hospital. They may be a bit uh, uh, concerned um, about uh, the environment, but we, our staff is wonderful. Our staff has been working overtime and our staff has really been doing a lot of work, uh, cleaning the rooms, cleaning the imaging equipment, making sure that everything is safe for patients uh, and that uh, patients should feel uh, comforted and uh, they should feel welcome to come to the DI department and the hospital as a whole uh, to ensure that their care needs are met. Absolutely, and throughout this conversation, we're going to actually show people some of the different measures that are in place right now to keep people safe when they're coming to the hospital. Are you seeing more cancellations? Um, people who you know just feel that maybe now isn't the right time, I'll just put that uh, test on hold for a while? Yeah, that's some feedback that we have been receiving. Um, some patients are concerned and they're, they're uh, volunteering to not attend uh, to their appointment. And one of the downsides to that is, well, first to the patient themselves, they may be uh, delaying a diagnosis, they may be delay delaying their treatment since diagnostic imaging and the images that we 
uh, provide, for example, biopsies, uh, if they're not being done, then you're, unfortunately your care does get uh, uh, delayed uh, further down the road. But the other issue too is if you do have a booked appointment and you don't show up to your book, booked appointment, that's an open gap. And that open gap could have been used by another patient as well. So there's two, two issues here if patients don't show up for their appointments. And I think that's the message that uh, we're trying to get out today is to just reassure people that uh, things at the hospital are actually fine and that patients should attend their appointments if they're scheduled. If they can't attend the appointment, perhaps it's best if they give us at least a day or two notice ahead of time, and then we can fill that spot with someone else. Good information, because like you said, really it affects you and not getting the diagnosis, but also someone else who could have filled that yeah. spot. Mm -hmm. Now to Dr. Ng, I want to talk about the situation in the emergency department. And uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the approximate wait times, the amount of time you can expect to wait in our emergency departments. And it has the current expected wait time as well as the historical data. And quite often lately when I'm looking on there, the current wait times are well below the historical data there. So that's, you know, I think that the wait times, if you were going to go to an emergency department, now would be the time to go in that aspect. What are you seeing? Yeah, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had a significant drop in the number of people coming to the emergency department. A lot of it, I think, is a fear from the public uh, that they may perhaps catch COVID in the department. Uh, whatever the reason may be, uh, it's a province for not what, province-wide phenomenon and we're, we're especially at the beginning of COVID in March we saw a significant drop in the number of people coming with a stroke or heart attack or severe illnesses that we normally would see a significant drop off and then it picked up over the summer and since the lockdown again it's dropped off significantly such that uh, at both sites we're seeing volumes of about 100 patients a day when we usually see about 140 so we're only seeing 75 uh, percent of our volume which means that uh, uh, patients aren't really waiting because we actually have capacity in the department. Does that concern you? I am worried about the numbers of illnesses and severe cases that we're potentially missing in the community, uh, heart attacks and strokes. I, I, it's hard to imagine that these would actually decrease dramatically to that degree. And so I'm fearful that patients uh, may be having severe illness and they're not uh, coming to the emergency room in a timely fashion. Uh, we are seeing certain cases uh, now that when patients do arrive, although our volume is less, the patients we see are much sicker and uh, much more intensive to take care of. So the, really the message is if you feel that you have an emergency, please by all means come to the emergency department. If you feel you have troubles accessing care, uh, there are other alternatives as well, but any emergency you feel severe chest pain, headache, uh, trouble breathing, severe fever, extreme weakness, signs of stroke, please come to the emergency department. We're prepared and, and we're very happy to take care of you. Don't wait. Don't wait. So if you haven't been to the hospital over the past year, you might not recognize this place when you do show up. There have been many changes put in place, mostly to keep people safe, keep people um, able to spread out, keep appropriate social distancing. And Erica Vitale is the Director of Infection Prevention and Control at our hospital. And we asked her to walk us through some of the things that you can expect if you do visit right now. Kind of like you're going to be coming into Fort Knox. So there's a lot of questions we're asking. Uh, we want to know if you've traveled in the last 14 days, if you've been in contact with a sick person that's traveled, if you've had an exposure or tested positive um, for COVID-19. Um, and then if you have any symptoms, so there's a lot of symptoms that we ask about because COVID-19 has a variety of uh, different uh, symptoms. And um, we're asking to make sure that you're not experiencing any of those symptoms th uh, the particular day that you're here. High touch surfaces are disinfected twice daily. Um, patient rooms are cleaned daily. And of course, any equipment or um, furniture or things that we use uh, maybe during your appointment is cleaned after following that appointment. So it's clean for the next person. So for the general public, just think about anytime you touch a surface that you could potentially pick up some microorganisms, including COVID-19. Um, if you've had to touch the elevator button or a door handle, 
um, then think about cleaning your hands right away as soon as you see um, alcohol-based hand rub available. And they are available throughout the building, so it is uh, generally pretty easy to uh, find some hand sanitizer. Clearly, our waiting rooms were quite crowded uh, previously, um, so we couldn't continue to operate that way. Um, but in order to fit uh, enough chairs to accommodate the appointments that we do have, um, we have ordered um, like plexiglass dividers between the chairs. Um, so that there's no risk of droplets, respiratory droplets from one uh, individual passing to the next individual because you've got that solid barrier um, in between you. I so hope it's not our norm forever. I hope we get through this and we're not having to take all these extra precautions all the time. Um, but yes, definitely for the foreseeable future until we have uh, enough of the population immune to the disease. So either through natural immunity or through um, the vaccination. So with respect to patient placement, so if we have um, individuals that are being admitted to hospital uh, and they are symptomatic with any of the signs and symptoms of COVID, we are trying to get them into a room by themselves or at least in a room where they can spatially separate from their roommate um, until we have those initial test results back and we can say, okay, well, it's not COVID, it's uh, a different cause for their admission. Unfortunately, with COVID, it's a, a novel respiratory infection. So what that means is that the general public we don't, none of us have immunity to it. So healthcare workers are susceptible, patients are susceptible, visitors are susceptible. So anybody could come down with this infection, which does appear to be relatively easy to spread. Um, so we don't have the same, it's not the same as the flu because we just don't have that immunity. Now, Erica compared the hospital to Fort Knox, and you saw the pictures there of the screening areas um, that you are presented with when you come in to make sure that uh, you are okay to proceed and to help patients get in quicker. If you, if you have an appointment, our team has created a screening app so you can complete that process online before you come. And we will include that right now in the comments section below. So if you're coming, check that out and you can screen before you attend. June, I want to go over to you now. Um, your COVID journey started back in March, um, but you've been to the hospital for different appointments twice since then. So talk about what you felt like before you arrived and then what that experience was like being here. So Allison, before I arrived, I was very nervous. I actually did not know if I wanted to cancel my appointment or go. And I thought, no, you know what? Dr. Mazzetti, he's a great doctor. He wants me to have these tests and I need to get them done. I need to find out what's going on. Um, being a long hauler, I felt that uh, it was better to go than not to go. So once I showed up, all the protocols were in place. I felt very safe. The hand sanitizer was there. They did a screening and told me where to go right away. When I got to the one test, it was for a lung scan the staff was excellent. They made me feel comfortable. They told me that everything had been wiped down um, and that everything was safe. And we got through the test. And then I went back in December to Metropolitan Hospital and the protocol there was excellent as well. And the respiratory tech uh, therapists were excellent with me. They conducted a lung scan, um, no, a lung capacity test. Um, and so it went very well. They made me feel very comfortable. And I just want to mention it was a good thing I went because I'm a little bit under the normal rate and I have to have the test repeated in three months. So I would not have known that had I canceled. So I was really glad that I went, Allison, and I'm keeping up with my health. Great news. And, and that's exactly the message that we're trying to get out today. Don't put those appointments off. Um, Dr. Siddle, I want to talk to you. Maybe you can talk to patients who are watching this thinking, you know, I was scheduled to go for that screening test, breast cancer screening test or other, you know, a couple months back. If I wait until I feel comfortable, maybe I get the vaccination a couple months down the road, maybe in September, that's okay. What message do you have for them? Well, the message would be uh, it's going to create some problems in the system uh, because as you put off your screening tests, those patients that are now eligible um, will have to wait longer. Um, and so in our region alone, we are backlogged uh, for our breast screening program to the tune of about 13,000 patients. Uh, provincially, it's like in the hundreds of thousands. And you can see how it's going to take time to catch up. 
And as time goes by, we're going to miss out on early detection of disease. Uh, and we know that if things are detected earlier in the disease trajectory, the outcomes are generally better. So we, we just don't want patients uh, that could be uh, tested uh, to be delayed or missed. Um, so if possible, please get your screening done uh, in the hospital. Mammography is done in hospital as well as outside of hospital. And everywhere you go for your healthcare uh, is an extremely safe environment. Um, patients don't seem to have any issues with going to the grocery store, or Costco, or other places uh, where there aren't the measures put in place. Uh, every doctor's office and healthcare facility, um, to me, is one of the safest places to be when you're out. Uh, so why not do something good for your health and get screened? Now, how do I go about doing that? Do I, is there a number to call? Do I talk to my primary care provider? Um, what route, to, what is the best route to take, especially right now? So there are a few different routes depending on the cancer screening program that you're eligible for. Um, the easiest one is one that doesn't require you to leave your house, and that's the colon cancer check or the uh, colorectal cancer screening program. So uh, for the average risk patient who's eligible, this is uh, males and females between the ages of 50 and 74. It's an at-home test that's done. It's a stool-based test, and you can uh, get that through your primary care provider without direct interaction at the office. So uh, you could give your health care provider a call and see if you are eligible. Uh, there was a little bit of a delay in terms of invitations or reminder letters from uh, Cancer Care Ontario, Ontario Health. Um, and those are going to be resuming. So you will get a notification from uh, Health Ontario as well as your primary care provider to let you know uh, if you're eligible for that test. Uh, the other test, again, if you've had a test, you're usually reminded when uh, your recall is due. Uh, for new patients to a program, so women who've turned 50 in the last year, they would be getting their uh, initial invitation letter for breast screening. And again, that's a mammography. Uh, it's done at the hospital, but it can also be done outside of the hospital. Uh, women who are eligible for cervical cancer screening, uh, there is a little bit of a longer time frame between screening, so up to three years. Um, and so what we'd say is that is an essential service. It's an essential test that's needed to um, detect early changes that can lead to cervical cancer. So if you think you're due, give your healthcare provider a call and they'll let you know. And we have some links that we're going to include under this post with additional information on screening, who's eligible and uh, who to talk to if you would like to be screened. Um, one more question for you. I'm looking at you, but I'm seeing two sets of eyes uh, looking back at me here. So it, what is the message uh, being sent from behind you there above your shoulder? <laughs> So that is our lovely uh, poop emoji. So uh, the screening test for colorectal cancer is a stool test. Um, and that emoji, that poop emoji is supposed to make light of it. Uh, it is an extremely simple, safe, non-invasive test that patients do themselves. And, and although it can detect early stages of disease, what I like to focus on as well is when you get the test done, there is a much greater chance that you're gonna have a negative test and that alone can give reassurance and comfort in these uncertain times. So please don't delay and get your screening. Uh, March is Colorectal Cancer Screening Awareness Month and we will do everything we can to promote and advocate for our patients. Wonderful. A question now for Dr. Denoa. Um, Dr. Siddle talked about the concern of a backlog after. Is that something that concerns you with some of the different tests in your area? Yeah, that's yeah. thanks, Alice. And that's uh, certainly one of the challenges that we faced after the first wave. And uh, we suspect that may be another challenge that we're going to be facing after the second wave. And that goes back to uh, my initial comments and some of the other comments that my colleagues have uh, mentioned. And that would be if you do have an appointment, try and uh, keep your appointment or phone ahead of time, a few days ahead of time, so we can plan um, to try and avoid that cascade effect uh, that my colleague was talking about, where in a few months from now, if things do get better, uh, we might have a lot of patients on a wait list and the wait list may be longer than usual. So we're really trying to avoid that now by getting this message out now to ensure patients are attending the hospital and making sure that they're, they're looking after themselves, speaking to their providers uh, and making sure that their care uh, pathways are well underway. But you're right, uh, that is something that we're, we're planning for and that is something we're concerned about um, again, after the second wave, uh, to ensure that we don't have significantly larger or longer wait lists, which may impact patients' care down the road. And we heard Dr. Siddle talk about um, you know, it, the longer you wait, the less opportunity there is to catch your cancer when it's in the curative stage. 
what are the other risks of putting off some of the tests? Yeah, so certainly um, you're right. That's probably the key one is if you do have a delay in diagnosis, then that ultimately will delay potentially in your care and your treatment, which can affect your, your overall outcome uh, uh, in the long term. So I think that's probably one of the, uh, the major uh, issues uh, that uh, we want to try and avoid for our patients uh, to ensure that that doesn't occur. Um, and uh, there, there does, uh, it may lead to some confusion down the road as well. Um, if we do have a significant cascade effect where patients are showing up later and there's a longer wait list, um, that can confuse uh, things for, uh, for the system uh, because we have so many extra patients. Um, and that's probably another uh, a downside uh, to this uh, situation as well. Thanks for that perspective. And now I want to go to uh, Dr. Ng to get a little more perspective from the emergency department. Um, we have a no visitor policy at the hospital right now, been in place for, for quite a while to keep people safe while they're here. What is the situation when you go into the emergency department? Are you able to bring someone with you? Uh, right now, we still have a no visitor policy, although the main exceptions are if uh, you're with your child, uh, so they allow a uh, uh, accompaniment for a pediatric patient, or if you have a dying family member, they will allow one family member and one family member only. And um, if you have a, um, a family member or you're a, a decision maker for a person with a se severe uh, uh, disability, uh, these are the cases where we will allow a family member into the emergency department. And that brings up a problem of communication. So it's important to, to uh, uh, leave your number with the triage nurse if you are a person who can speak on behalf of your family member or we have questions, it's important that we know your number, that we can call you when the patient's visit is uh, completed so you can pick them up for a ride or we notify, ask you about further information or if we decide to admit your family member. So it's, it's very different from previously in that we uh, have strict no visitor policies except for those three exceptions. And you talked a bit earlier about um, some of the conditions that if you're experiencing, you want to make sure that you get to an emergency department. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that, about when you absolutely should go to an emergency department and when it might be good to seek an alternative option? It's really hard for many patients to really judge their own symptoms. So if you feel that you're really having an emergency, such as you're having severe shortness of breath, chest pain, massive headache, abdominal pain, fever, extreme weakness. If you're having signs of a stroke, such as you have a sudden loss of vision or speech or a sudden loss of uh, uh, strength in your arm or leg or, or severe numbness, these are types of things uh, that if they really alarm you, do call 911 or come to the emergency department. If you feel the symptoms might be milder, such as a mild flu symptoms, mild shortness of breath, a low grade fever, there are alternatives such as uh, urgent care centers. If you feel that you may be suffering from some mild COVID symptoms, we have the assessment centers as well situated at both hospitals. And uh, they actually have a physician there and they will also assess you. And if, if they feel that you're sick enough that you may need further investigations or even hospitalization, they'll refer you right to the emergency department. So we have a really good system set up uh, in the hospital area to take care of you. And with a decrease in ER visits, there also is a decrease in ambulance call volume. And so our ambulance wait times have actually decreased dramatically over the last several months. So the system is uh, well prepared to take care of uh, the health of Windsor Heights and Leamington Heights. And that's really good for people to know right now. And I, I did have a question. What if your symptoms, if you're at home and you're experiencing symptoms that are similar to COVID, you're having trouble breathing, should I go to emergency or should I book an appointment um, to be tested? What is What should I do? I think if you're really struggling to breathe, you should come to the emergency room. If it's something you feel you can uh, tolerate, it's mild, uh, you might consider uh, calling for an appointment at the assessment center. But really, if you're short of breath, uh, do come to the emergency room. There's also telehealth you could call. Um, or sometimes if it's very mild, you, there may be an urgent care clinic you can uh, be seen at. But if you're concerned at all, do come to the emergency department. We're well trained to triage you and quickly determine how severe you are and we'll treat you accordingly. Now I wanna bring another voice into this conversation and introduce everyone to Luana Molani. She's a breast cancer survivor and an X-ray technician at Windsor Regional Hospital. And she has an important message for anybody thinking of putting off a mammogram because of COVID-19. 
So no one likes coming to the hospital at any time, especially during a pandemic, and especially if you're having to come in for a mammal. However, I can't stress enough how important that truly is. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with invasive lobular breast cancer on a regular annual mammography. Um, because of early detection, it was stage two, which required surgery and radiation therapy and no further treatments. Since then, I've been given a good prognosis, and a lot of that is because of early detection. Had I not had a regular screening, I wouldn't have been diagnosed until much, much more later and advanced in the disease because there was no, I did not have a lump, there was no palpable lesions, and it wouldn't have been diagnosed until much later, and the outcome could have been much worse. And right now, um, yeah, it's, it's a scary time. It is a pandemic, however, Everybody, patients and staff are all screened before they enter the hospital and everybody is adheres to very strict cleaning guidelines. So everything is clean, everybody is screened, it's a safe environment. So to all those people who are at home and are afraid to come, it's imperative that you do come, have that screening done, know that you're in a safe environment and screening truly is the best cure. Absolutely. Thank you, Luana, for sharing that important message. And I don't think we can stress it enough today. It's a safe place. If you need to come to the hospital, absolutely make the trip come to the hospital. And uh, let's go around the table one last time um, to all our panelists today. Any last messages that you have for people with a scheduled appointment, in need of emergency care, or experiencing really anything out of the ordinary that they're considering? Um, having looked at and would have looked at uh, in other times. Dr. Siddle, let's start with you. Sure, uh, and we've focused on prevention and screening. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is just put a little plug in for the prevention piece of, of lowering cancer incidents. So right now with students being uh, out of the school system and learning from home, uh, they aren't um, accessing the vaccination uh, that's available for them through public health, uh, and that is the uh, HPV vaccine. So it is available through your primary care provider. Um, if you want your child to be vaccinated, please contact your primary care provider or the public health unit, and it can be arranged. Uh, again, we're all about prevention. If we can and lower our cancer incidence um, and we can find diseases earlier, that is the main objective. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Genoa? Yeah, I'd like to talk about um, the patient experience, um, the, uh, the hopefully alleviate some anxiety of our patients in the community, uh, that it's a positive experience, um, even though you may have uh, a difficult time with uh, coming to the hospital. Um, our staff have worked overtime. Uh, they're doing quite a bit of work in cleaning and, and ensuring that you do feel confident with the care that you're receiving and that you do feel uh, safe in this environment. Uh, we have a lot of trust in our staff, obviously. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job and uh, they're going to continue doing it uh, in order to serve you and the community. Great. Absolutely. Thanks to all of the staff and thanks, Dr. Genoa. Dr. Ng. I would echo uh, what my colleagues say that uh, we are very uh, uh, keen on making sure that the emergency department is safe and clean. We have adequate PPE. We're well trained. Uh, we're well screened as to uh, making sure that uh, uh, the rooms are clean. We have negative pressure rooms. We certainly isolate people who have uh, active COVID symptoms. And so please, you're not going to catch COVID in the emergency room. You'll be safe there. We just want to take care of you if you have an emergency. The other thing I'd like to note that uh, although we've seen a decrease in all cases, we haven't seen a decrease in mental health and overdoses. And so that there's a significant burden of mental health in the community that really isn't well addressed. And new, do know that there are crisis lines in the community to call. There's a mental health urgent care center that we set up. And so if you have any issues, please call your family doctor or do access a mental health uh, uh, a crisis line. And if there's any issues, like you're feeling suicidal, you want to hurt yourself, please come to the emergency room. We'll take care of you as well. Great, and we'll get those numbers and links put up on our uh, post here as well, thanks. And June, final word of the day, over to you. So being a long hauler and surviving COVID, I've learned that health is everything. So please don't put off those appointments. I felt very safe, I felt very comfortable, and I really wanna encourage everyone to go to your appointment, keep up with your health. Thank you. Thank you, June. 
And thank you, Dr. Siddle, Dr. Denoa, Dr. Ng, June, all thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, please share this if you felt that the information was valuable. Help us get the word out. Um, again, we've posted many links here as well that uh, you can use to access different resources throughout the county. So hopefully you found that helpful as well. That's it for today. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.